Hello everyone and welcome to today's Connect and Learn webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today or in the future. We recognise and value the knowledge and wisdom of people with a lived experience of addiction, their families and supporters. We celebrate their strengths and resilience in facing the challenges associated with their recovery and value their important role in the development and delivery of health and community services. My name is Rebecca and I will be facilitating today's webinar, Working with Trauma and Addiction, Understanding its Impact and the Implications for Our Work. This webinar series is funded by the Victorian Department of Health and hosted by Turning Point. We like our webinars to be as interactive as possible, so please ask questions via the Q&A function, not the chat function. The questions will be collated and answered by our presenters at the end. Please be aware that our webinars are recorded and are later made available on the Turning Point website. We encourage you to stay to the end of the webinar and complete the exit survey when the QR code appears on the slide or it will also be forwarded via email later today. Um, our presenters have kindly agreed to share a copy of the slides which will be later emailed to you. I'd like to now introduce our presenters Sally Thomas and Anna Bow. Sally is a senior social worker at Turning Point working with multiple programs to support clients navigate and link into AOD services as well as providing linkage to other psychosocial supports. These roles also involve supporting family members and concerned others. Sally also has a background in youth mental health counselling and a further interest in understanding the socioeconomic determinants of health outcomes for AOD clients. Anna is a senior clinical psychologist who has worked at Turning Point over a range of programs most recently, the COPE program, which is an evidence-based treatment for trauma and substance use disorders. Prior to working at Turning Point, Anna has worked in community health and homelessness. Through her work, Anna seeks to highlight the value of connection in AOD treatment. Thank you both so much for um, taking the time to present for us today. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Sally Thomas and I am a social worker here at Turning Point on Warrantry Country and I would like to pay my respects for the traditional owners of the land on which I'm working from today and being able to speak with all of you and I would also like to um, welcome all Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal people who are joining us today. Uh, I would like to provide a little bit more about um, myself and the program that I work with. So I work within the AOD Pathways team and we are a statewide service supporting people with complex needs, uh, experiencing barriers, accessing AOD supports. Uh, so given we are a statewide service, we work predominantly uh, over the phone and we accept referrals by the phone or through the, our online portal, which can be found on the Direct Line website. And we do have capacity to see clients face-to-face -face, uh, here at Richmond, uh, so long as they can attend to the Turning Point website. Um, and I'll provide a bit more context to what may be considered a complex client presenting to AOD Pathways. Uh, the word complex can hold many different ideas and meanings for different people. Uh, it can be uh, helpful to stop and think, uh, what does complex mean to me when I see a referral for a client uh, with the word complex included? Um, what's the first thing that comes to mind? So has this client presented with uh, more social complexity? Has their day-to-day -day social, emotional, mental or physical well-being uh, being impacted? Is this inhibiting their capacity to function at their usual level? Are they presenting as overwhelmed, unable to cope with the current supports or lack thereof at their disposal? Is my client experiencing the type of circumstances that may lead someone to use substances in order to gain some 
relief or reprieve from distress in the short term. Does this person have a trauma history, recent trauma concern that might be hindering them from successfully navigating uh, service systems and, and finding their appropriate supports? Uh, and I'll now hand over to Anna to introduce herself. That's a good start. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, Sal, and thanks, Rebecca. Um, thanks, Ken. <laughs> I've got a team working behind us here. Um, welcome, everybody. I'd like to start by um, also acknowledging that I come to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emergency and, and emerging. And also acknowledge and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. And I'd like to pay my respects and recognise the input of people with lived experience of trauma, substance use and mental health conditions. I think the large amount of interest um, in this webinar today um, is a real testament to um, you know, how close it is to people's hearts. So we will be talking about the topic very broadly. Um, obviously, it's a massive area and we would need probably weeks or months to actually go through it as thoroughly as we would like to. But Sal and I's intention today is, is really about sharing some of our insights around the richness and challenges that we have found in working in this space. Um, and even though it's a broad conversation, I guess I do want to highlight to people that thinking about these issues can sometimes be distressing and can impact us in unexpected ways. So please feel free to kind of drop in or out, do whatever you need if you feel like you need to take a break. Um, the this is getting recorded, so you can always return to it later. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, my role at Turning Point is as a psychologist on the COPE program these days. And that's a program where we're working with women who are 25 and older and um, treating both the trauma, so PTSD or complex PTSD, which we'll be talking about in a minute, um, and their AOD. So let's get to it, shall we? And let's have a little bit of think around what we mean by trauma. So trauma is really any event that involves exposure to an actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence, and it has the potential to be traumatic for that individual. It can impact a person's physical, emotional, cognitive and social well-being and their relationships and can be caused by humans or it can be natural. It can be two types. It can be that single incident of unexpected trauma, which might be something that we kind of more commonly associate with PTSD, or it can be that repeated prolonged cumulative traumas profile. And we'll kind of unpack these a little bit in a minute. But no matter whether it's a single event or not, these experiences can shatter people's beliefs about themselves, the world and other people. I won't go into this in too much detail either, because we really, as I say, don't have the time, but just really the key point here is to recognise that trauma is a really common experience for people um, and particular types of communities can be more impacted as well. As I say, uh, we won't have time to kind of unpack this today. I guess what most of us would see in the AOD setting is that often we're working with people that have an experience of trauma and often that trauma is more complex in nature. But before we jump into kind of thinking about that more complex PTSD profile, um, here in Australia, the diagnostic manual that we use is the DSM-5. Um, so we thought it was important maybe just to highlight how PTSD is defined according to the DSM-5. So essentially the DSM-5 speaks to four clusters of symptoms. So intrusions, avoidance, alterations in someone's thinking and mood, and alterations in their reactivity and arousal. What we know, and I think, um, I imagine what many of you experience is that often the people that we're working with have a more complex trauma presentation, which essentially means that people that will have the symptoms of PTSD, but they'll also be experiencing difficulties with affect regulation, maybe some persistent negative beliefs about themselves and struggle in interpersonal relationships. When this has happened, particularly early in life, these impacts can be exacerbated by their knock-on effects, which can happen in a number of different domains, including physical health, ability to engage in things like education, more likely to engage in high-risk behaviours, leading to involvement with things like the forensic system. And basically, often when it's happened early on in life, it's really that people have missed out on the opportunities to um, learn the things that a lot of us take for granted as adults and how we move in the world. Um, also, what I wanted to kind of mention here is that um, 
Many of you have probably heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the ACEs they're commonly referred to, which really highlights the impact that these kind of experiences can have when people have them in childhood. So in that study, it found that there was an increased risk of chronic health conditions, so things like diabetes and heart disease, that people are more likely, as we know in the field, to develop substance use disorders, often with an earlier onset. They're going to be more likely to experience things like homelessness, poorer mental health, and higher rates of attempted suicide. What this study also highlighted was that the um, risk of these impacts increases with the number of adverse events that people have experienced. Um, which again, I think is probably no surprise for people. Over to you, Sal. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so now, because we are talking in the context uh, of uh, substance use and trauma, I wanted to just give a brief, brief look at what a substance use disorder uh, can involve, include. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> Clients can experience any or more of the following uh, issues that are that are indicated on the slide, uh, ranging from mild to severe, depending on how many criteria are identified and uh, how these can then impact the individual, their families, friends and wider communities. I think that's something that's often uh, overlooked. This is not necessarily just affecting the person of concern. This has a tendency to affect everybody else around them. So it's quite it's quite important to look at the ideas of problematic um, patterns of substance use, um, which would be leading to a, a significant distress or impairment, perhaps to themselves or a family member. I uh, then this is uh, the idea that someone is using more than or. Um, longer than intended when it comes to the substance use that you've identified. Um, uh, people using um, over lengthy amounts of time, um, spending a lot of time sourcing that substance, using or recovering from that substance, um, the effects uh, to uh, and the efforts to reduce or control that use uh, has been unsuccessful. And if that person is experiencing cravings, uh, physical or psychological, and perhaps the tolerance uh, to the substance that they've been using has increased, therefore, perhaps with the knock-on effect of them having to use more of that substance. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Sal. Um, so there are a number of theories that are being put forward to explain why trauma and addiction can so commonly occur. Um, so for many, self-medication can play a critical role in the development and maintenance of problematic substance use. And, you know, in the short term, substance use can be a really effective way of dampening down PTSD symptoms. Um, and just like PTSD itself, they can both be adaptive in the beginning. It's really once these kind of patterns become established and that it starts to become more problematic. So in that sense, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, um, alcohol or other kind of depressants might be a really effective way of coping with nightmares, poor sleep, flashbacks, things like that. I guess what we wanted to just let give a bit of an overview of though was that there are some other theories that also contribute to the picture. Um, and these include the high risk hypothesis whereby there's high rates of PTSD um, are driven by the fact that many people with a substance use problem are at higher risk of exposure to trauma. And then we know that kind of the more trauma that you're exposed to, the more likely you're gonna develop something like PTSD. There also there's a susceptibility hypothesis that's really suggesting that um, people with substance use disorders are more susceptible to developing PTSD after trauma exposure, either because they might've missed out on those earlier opportunities I was mentioning in the slide before, of being able to learn how to cope with things in the world or in the sense that they may be physiologically susceptible from the perspective of having a dysregulated stress response system. And that can be a result of repeated cycles of things like intoxication and withdrawal. And as I say, this can predispose somebody to developing PTSD. And there are another, you know, there are a number of a whole range of things of common factors that might be psychological, biological, psycho social. Um, sociological that can all contribute to this high rate of co-occurrence. Co Either way, at the end of the day, what we want the take-home message to be really is that when they co-occur, 
we can know that each kind of serves to maintain and exacerbate the other. So that really kind of highlights how important it is for us to be able to hold both in mind when we're working with people. Um, we just popped the trauma-informed care slide in here, just as a, I guess a, a reminder that we're all very much working within this framework, which really acknowledges that we assume that trauma exists, that we um, know the importance of um, incorporating a sense of safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration and empowerment um, into our work with people and how important it is to kind of recognise, you know, cultural, historical and gender issues and awareness as well and power dynamics that have impacted the person, communities, um, and that really within this framework, we really seek to um, support people to recognise their own strengths, to become resourceful and, and hope that we see that drive to survive kind of um, transition into an opportunity to learn to thrive. Over to you, Sal. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to present an idea or an overview of uh, what the flow on effect of trauma and AOD can have for clients who are attempting to link in with services. Um, so what you as, as a clinician will be trying to ascertain, has your client experienced a, a traumatic event? Can you and or your client easily identify this as a traumatic experience? Um, it, it will be helpful to assess how much understanding your client has about uh, supports available to them in these areas of concern and uh, how this might be affecting them. Uh, then, as a clinician, you're wanting to be identifying the need for services, what type of services are appropriate, uh, and supporting your client throughout the referral process until they're linked. Sometimes it can feel a bit tricky to ask the questions uh, without unpacking the whole trauma right there and then. It can feel uncomfortable as a clinician to start that off. So does this sometimes hold you back from asking a client about how they might be uh, presenting because you're not sure what, where it might lead? You wouldn't be the first clinician to feel that way. Uh, Anna will speak a little bit more to this uh, idea later and finding that balance of understanding of what's going on without unpacking too much. Also, understanding that all of this can take time and if your service is not able to respond to all your clients' needs, you may need to offer more generalised client support in the meantime. So can you consider a, a shared care approach with another service uh, or provide some integrated care? Systems as they are may not uh, have immediate capacity to meet the needs of your client directly or in a time frame that suits the client. You may be supporting a client whilst they remain on a lengthy wait list for another service. Uh, these issues can sometimes find us uh, working outside our comfort zone as clinicians. For example, if I'm predominantly a, a, an AOD worker, how much mental health intervention and support can I do and vice versa? Uh, that's where acknowledging that we can provide generalist responses without being specialists in all areas. We can work through an informed lens of the other issues a client might have with whilst doing the work in our area of greater understanding. Supporting people's experiencing distress or difficulty is a very transferable skill. And again, we can go back to the basics, identify what's going on, what's the presenting problem. We can validate that presenting concern. Some people will present to services with no experience of being listened to or validated that their concern is important. Building that rapport with your client, your relationship with your client is key. As you build trust with a client, you will build better outcomes for them as well. We may not always be aware of how big an impact 
uh, the most simple client interaction can mean to someone who may not have very much supportive contact within their community. Clients with poor service relationships in the past may require a different approach, more encouragement to feel confident in using or trusting services. There may be quite an entrenched belief that it's either services or themselves will never be able to make change. So what this may mean for your client, everyone has a unique response to trauma. There are a lot of combinations of symptoms, behaviours to list, um, and given the stats indicated of the Australians um, experiencing PTSD symptoms, and that's this is not including chronic ongoing distress, uh, it's probably impossible to, to list these on a slide, uh, but I've tried to provide a, a brief uh, list of uh, identifiers, um, anger and emotional outbursts, lowered self-esteem, fear, shame, guilt, fear, anxiety and panic, chaotic thinking styles, uh, isolation, being unresponsive to services and appointment reminders. So uh, with this in mind, the best practice can be to try and work through that trauma-informed lens. Uh, taking and talking in a safe and contained way about trauma without diving into the specifics. Uh, it's also important uh, to point out that this is nothing new to us. Uh, systems have worked at odds, at odds sometimes with, with some client groups for a lengthy period of time. And many client groups have reported uh, a repeated narrative of being ineligible for services and falling between the gaps. Historically, mental health and AOD services have worked in silos, uh, provided a message that the client needs to attend to their other issues before they can attend their service. Uh, this can seem very confusing and frustrating for clients and clinicians alike, and it also requires a, a lot more capacity for us as clinicians uh, to manage client expectations and continue to provide a meaningful support to the clients. So if we know substance use and trauma to be a co-occurring set of conditions, why then do systems think uh, that these things can be easily compartmentalised? And a lot of the time, this is not realistic. The increase in complex client presentations at health services has increased. You're not imagining it. A possible blend of COVID-19 and current social climate, such as ongoing isolation, financial distress, and a lack of resources to engage with appropriate and timely healthcare can be linked to clients presenting to your service with more acute medical conditions or unmet health issues, um, adding another layer of concern to supporting your clients. Technology has assumed clients are capable to respond seven days a week, uh, often demanding a response and, and not taking into account a lack of possible tech access or capacity. As service providers, we do need to understand how this will impact our clients, ourselves, our teams, and our organisational systems. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Sal. Um, so in order, I guess, to understand how this might intersect um, with working in the AOD space, we thought it might be helpful to think, uh, well, to talk a little bit about Judith Herman's three stages of recovery. Um, Judith Herman was one of the seminal authors um, in the field of trauma and sought to really deepen our understanding of trauma and its treatment. I'm sure some, you know many of you may well have heard of her name and um, the books that she's written. So she really highlights that there are three st important stages to thinking about how to support people in working through trauma. The first one, the stage one, really being about building up safety and stabilisation and given an example of a, a program that does this. But I guess if we're thinking about working in the AOD space, this is really where a lot of our services are at. This is what we're dealing with. Um, what we're really seeking to be able to support people to do is to feel safer and more stable in their lives. And that might mean literally in their own body, it might be in their relationships. And as Sal's highlighted, those relationships 
might not just be those that are interpersonal or with themselves in nature, it might also be their relationships to services and organisations and community. Um, and this is where we, I think there's a really, there's a lot of work that we can do in this space. And this is where we can really, and I, I hear this all the time when we get referrals for COPE, hearing amazing work that people are doing to support clients to learn how to regulate their emotions and feel less overwhelmed with their lives. They're really working on um, supporting people to have a greater capacity to manage often really painful and unwanted emotions. Um, sometimes in the text, you'll see that um, these, this kind of um, work is referred to as present focus therapies. Um, so it's really that skills and, and strategies to manage the symptoms of trauma. Um, stage two, which is where um, the program I'm involved with um, is kind of really based is where you, we might be more past focused in this in this kind of stage where we're feeling that people are um, you know, emotionally regulated enough, they feel safe enough and stable enough that they can start to do the trauma focused work. And there are lots of different ways that we can do that. COPE um, uses a trauma focused therapy called prolonged exposure. But many of you, I'm sure, would have heard of things like EMDR, CPT, and all of these treatments have an element of um, exposure in the sense that this is where people are really starting to talk about their experiences. And then the final stage, which I hope lots of us at some point get the opportunity to see, is where we see people really starting to step into that idea of thriving. They're no longer in that survival mode, but they're really reconnecting with themselves as people, with their lives and really starting to feel that they've got purpose and a richness that's um, reappeared or for many possibly has never been present. Um, I guess the other point I did wanna make um, in respect to uh, these stages is that sometimes I know we can be quite fearful of um, you know, talking about the trauma um, and, and I guess essentially engaging in the exposure work because we're worried that people's substance use is going to get exacerbated or that maybe their mental health is going to deteriorate. And I just wanted to kind of mention that there is evidence to suggest that this isn't the case, um, that in fact people um, don't necessarily increase or they don't increase their substance use in respect to exposure work. And that actually once we start to work with both and hold both in mind, um, we can see a significant benefit for the clients Often they're relieved to be able to talk, to be talking about this stuff. Um, and what we also know is that by addressing both, um, it gives them a better chance of actually any kind of recovery that they've done in the AOD space is more likely to be sustained and maintained. That said, it's obviously a very much a case by case and we don't want to be re-traumatising our clients. So it's really about doing it in a thoughtful, sensitive way and really getting our heads around you know, as being able to assess that level of safety and stability that someone's got to um, before we start to um, recommend the trauma-focused work. Um, so what does this mean for our work? Um, well, as, you know, I guess I've said already, assume trauma, you know, I guess and I've, I'm sure that many of you are doing that, that even if it's not spoken yet, this is what trauma-informed care is all about. We presume that it's present. We might not know about it yet. Um, and that's why it's really important that we establish a physical and psychological safety for the person. And this can be both, you know, on an individual level, but it can also be again within teams and organisations. And this is important because as Sal's highlighted, highlighted, we know that when people are managing both, they do have poorer health outcomes. Their psycho psychological health is generally poorer. Their psychosocial functioning is generally poor and the clinical um, presentation is that, that what we kind of know and what the research has shown is that this group are likely to have higher rates of polysubstance use, rates of suicide are higher, the rate earlier onset of problems with substance use, which we know kind of um, tends to suggest a um, more significant problematic trajectory and that there are higher rates of overdose. Um, and in this space, I really liked um, I really love Janina Fisher, who um, is another trauma-informed therapist. The way that she kind of frames this is that when we see the person in our work, we see the symptoms of how they've survived. So for us in AOD, one of those symptoms is their substance use. Addiction is a survival strategy that people are using to manage their trauma symptoms. So in this space, what we start to see, and, and I think in that stage one material, we can start to see the 
it can be really helpful to give people psycho psychoeducation. They're living it, but sometimes their framework for their experiences is not there yet. So what psychoeducation in respect to how these two, um, you know, I'm using disorder type language here, but you know, whatever language feels right for you, but when these two conditions are present for the people we're working with, actually being able to give people education around how it works um, can really help to validate their experience. Because I guess what often I've experienced in the work is that people are really framing um, the way that they're moving in the world is that they're, I'm a psycho, I'm bad, I'm mad, you know, and these are often messages that people have received from people in their lives um, and they've really internalised them. And you can kind of get how that operates when often these experiences have started from when people are really young and it's actually been a way to cope in a really often scary and threatening environment where we need to still rely on caregivers. So instead, we've internalised that in order to understand what's going on. Um, and I think that's, I guess, the main thing, as I say, you're probably going to hear me keep coming back to this, is just holding in mind both conditions. And as I say, I'm probably um, telling people a lot of what they already know here. Um, and I guess it's just holding in mind that by doing that, we're really going to be supporting people to make significant and sustained change. And hopefully they experience that as developing a richness and purpose in their lives. So now, I guess when I started to think about this, I started to think about what it means for me when I'm kind of working with people and how it kind of reveals its, itself, um, whether that can be in the room or sometimes in me. So I guess, um, what I also want to speak to in the next few slides is really seeing that there are a lot of parallel processes here. So when I'm kind of talking about behaviour here, really what I'm inviting people to think about is that we can pick up reactions in ourselves as well as in our clients. And all of this is really rich information for the work that we do. And I'd really highlight to people that if we can understand the people that we're working with, their behaviour is being driven by a need, you know, what we might think is dysfunctional may be serving a really important function for them. And I guess that also speaks to what I was saying earlier about the psychoeducation component. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the window of tolerance in a minute, so I'll probably speak more around what can happen for us in that space as well. The other point here, again, I think I'm just probably highlighting a lot of what we're already doing is the importance of, our la of language. That's our tool of the trade, so to speak. Um, so really important for us to be sensitive in the way that we um, communicate with people. Uh, we'll talk a little bit um, in, a, in a few minutes about how to explore trauma. But I guess here also highlighting how important it is to be um, clear around managing people's expectations of what we can deliver and what we can't, which sometimes can be really hard in this space when we're seeing people that are really distressed we sometimes want to do more than we actually can. So just staying grounded in what can we realistically do for this person and helping them to just manage if there's a gap between that. I think often what people really appreciate is feeling held in mind and cared for, even if we can't kind of deliver a detox bed the next day. Knowing that that person cares and is working for them is, in, you know, is gold, basically. Um, Clearly, you know, this is the trauma-informed stuff. We want to be collaborative, we want to be providing choices, recognising power dynamics, which can be tricky when people are involved with systems like the forensic system or child protection, um, when, they're, you know, the reality is that um, there's an element that you can't be, um, you know, that, that there is a power imbalance going on there. Um, disease is, I've intentionally written it that way, it's not a typo. Um, I guess I wanted to speak here, I've already mentioned a little bit about physical illnesses and, you know, the high rates of chronic physical illness that we might see in this group. Um, you know, in addition to the ones I've said already, that might be autoimmune conditions, irritable bowel, um, hormonal um, issues for women, chronic pain that may or may not have a source, um, which I think is a real testament to, the, I guess, the interaction between trauma the body and the mind as well. Um, other things I guess I wanted to show is that, that disease might also be in how you see the person in the room with you. You know, the person may struggle to sit still, they might, their posture might be a bit collapsed or they might be presenting perfectly. And that might not be particularly helpful in assessing for it. 
but um, because that's the whole spectrum of how somebody might be. But you know that person and you will start to recognise what might be um, playing out as more an indicator of trauma. Um, other symptoms we might see um, and we'd be no doubt familiar with is the kind of high levels of impulsivity, things like driving recklessly, um, misadventure, all that kind of stuff that people can engage in to get a sense of, you know, if someone's really shut down, those kinds of um, behaviours can help them to feel alive again. Deliberate self-harm is another one, which kind of releases adrenaline and endorphins again to kind of make people feel something, as well as things like compulsive sexual behaviour, gambling, eating disorders. They can all kind of interact with history. At the end of the day, with you know, I think I'll make some assumptions here. What we tend to see in our AOD space is more of a complex trauma presentation. So really what we tend to see is that kind of emotional dysregulation and relationship issues rather than the kind of well, we might find that people are experiencing those intrusive and re-experiencing symptoms, but really what we're probably more likely to see in the stage one stuff is that kind of um, dysregulation. What does this mean for treatment? Um, well, as Sal has highlighted, it can be a complicated picture and it can be helpful in those days um, when we're finding it to be challenging working to remind ourselves of that yeah we're here to do what we can and often you know the things that we don't even remember the things that clients can remember is incredibly meaningful for them a phone call a check-in remembering the name of their dog or you know things that really mean that you've heard them and you've connected with them so as I say, I think really a lot of the work that we're doing in this space is helping folks to learn how to regulate their emotions and how to respond to their nervous system, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a minute, to learn to self-soothe and reduce distress without needing substances in the mix. Now for a little bit of light relief, I thought um, here we've got some great examples, I think, of some really great caregiving and attachment going on. So. Um, you know, I don't, it, I, I, this is going to be a very brief overview, but attachment, the attachment system um, is really important in respect to experiences both as animals and as humans, yeah? It's a neurobiological system that provides us with a relationship context for us to develop emotional regulation skills, to learn how to be in relationship with others and with ourselves. It's where we get a sense of ourselves, and it's where we have an ability to connect. And when we learn as infants and children how to explore, understand and tolerate internal experience as well as that of others, it helps us to learn these things and learn how to move in the world. It helps us to process experiences and find ways to cope. It is where we learn to be soothed and calmed within these attachment relationships, which these guys are doing a great job of showing us how to do it. Um, and it's where we learn to get our needs met. And it's where we learn how this is modelled to us and that's where we learn to do it. So it's designed to be protective. Not telling you anything you probably don't know here, but obviously complex trauma interferes with this system. Its impact is reflected in brain structures and neurocircuitry. And in these less than good enough environments, infants and children miss out on opportunities to develop language for emotions, to develop an ability to problem solve, skills to regulate emotions, ability to self-soothe ability to have a positive experience of ourselves, to see ourselves as okay, to have a good enough sense of our own mind and a capacity to trust our own responses and decisions and to seek help effectively. So for the people we work with, their early experiences of attachments have often not been good enough. They've been in environments that have felt unsafe and or unreliable and, the impacts on their, and this impacts on their ability to trust others and themselves as adults. And in our work, we might see this play out as people struggling to engage in treatment. You know, they might put one step in and then, then one step back. They might be sensitive to feeling rejected. They might potentially have big reactions to small things. And there might be an intense neediness or a seeking out of reassurance. And amongst all of this, what we can often see is that maybe someone's first experience of significant attachment was actually with a substance. And here we are starting to talk to them about making changes and it makes sense that it might, might feel incredibly scary to think about doing. 
Now, what I've found is a really helpful way of framing this work, and, and this is where I want to highlight that kind of parallel process. So thinking about the people we work with, but also thinking about ourselves. So the window of tolerance is a way that we can think about that. Um, and this develops generally in the context, well, it does develop in the context of a good enough attachment experience. So let's just remember when people have been in environments which have been characterised by fear and threatening, and, and threatening environments, it doesn't have the opportunity to develop in the same way. So often what we're dealing with is somebody that might have a really narrow window of tolerance unless they're using substances. So I'm going to talk to that in a minute. But I just encourage people just to take a moment to think about, you know, when you know you're in your own window of tolerance and when you know you're not. Probably just before I started this webinar, I was probably right on the edge of my window of tolerance. Um, and we'll we'll speak to, because this is all about being human and the things that are going to work for us are going to be things that can work for our clients and we can model with our clients. But that's also not to minimise um, the experiences that they've had. So one of the ways I think, again, telling you what, you know, you know, one of the keys for us is working out what's the function of someone's substance use. And generally, um, and this is why I think the window of tolerance is such a great framework, is to think about substance as a way that people have learned to regulate their nervous system. And what that might mean is that, you know, those hyper arousal, you know, symptoms. So, so, you know, people might kind of, so people are experiencing those, so it's fear, anxiety, those are kind of really wound up ones, might be attracted to substances that can induce relaxation and or numbing. They might, you know, be attracted to the ones that can act as a chemical barrier to traumatic memory, like a social lubricant to help decrease those hypervigilant symptoms and anxiety. Substances that can induce sleep and enhance mood. So, you know, and what springs to mind for me is obviously things like alcohol and cannabis. And then we've got those hypoarousal symptoms, so the ones on the other end of the, the window, which is where people are really shut down. And we can think about why stimulants might be attractive in that space because they can increase alertness and confidence, yeah? They can give people a sense of power and control. They can com combat helplessness. They can counteract feelings of emptiness and hopelessness. Um, and um, so it's, you know, it's worth kind of starting to, I, I don't know, I find that helpful in thinking about the work that we do. And then tolerance, obviously, is, is a familiar concept for us. So, and again, as I said earlier, we can see that in the short term, when people first pick up a substance, not only maybe if they had their first experience of significant attachment and warmth, um, but they've also had an experience of having their symptoms kind of managed. So in the short term, you know, it's initially helpful, but in the long term, people need more and more, as we know, and then it can become habitual, more severe, and then less effective. So then what we need for recovery is to really start to think about how to make changes to the substance use in a way that's going to recognise and treat both conditions. Um, I've added in here just a, just a, I guess, something I've often thought about is to be careful of the assumptions that we make and certainly ones that I've made in, in the past as well where, you know, we can't assume that someone's got capacity to prioritise their life or their body um, particularly when they might have had um, their body basically used as a vehicle by others to use or harm. So don't, I guess I'm just inviting people maybe to not take for granted that people care about whether they live or not. Um, to think about the, you know, trauma-related shame and secrecy. You know, lives can feel safe and normal for people. Like to disclose the whole picture might feel unsafe for people. So to really kind of understand that that might be what makes it difficult for people to fully communicate. And it can be really scary for people to rely on others when maybe you've never had a significant experience of being able to trust and for another person to follow through and look after you. So what we're asking them to do is to start to do that with us and to give something, a substance, which has been reliable to a point, to give it up. Um, also on this, um, I haven't put the point in, but I wanted also just to highlight when I was thinking about the window of tolerance stuff and the parallel with um, the people we work with in ourselves is to think about, you know, nervous systems talk to nervous systems. We need to know ourselves. We need to know how to kind of settle ourselves down because that's going to help us to be present with our clients. It's going to help us to, you know, de-escalate what's going on for them 
to empathize, validate, and really help them to kind of feel um, a bit more grounded in the space. Um, so Sal and I, when we were putting this together, we're, we're talking about, you know, it can be really difficult to know how do we talk about trauma? And particularly when I first started out feeling like, oh, I can't talk about that at all. Like that's, you know, I'm going to, the person's going to become really dysregulated and suicidal and it's all going to, you know, go to hell in a handbasket kind of thing. So um, what we wanted to say here is, as I was saying earlier, that's not, that's not the case. Yeah. What we want to be able to do is to prep the person. So really what that means is kind of asking the client's permission to um, ask them about exposure to traumatic events and to be clear that they don't have to talk about these experiences or provide any details they don't want to. We want to be clear why we're asking about past trauma. I think Sal mentioned this earlier. It may not be obvious to the person how their current situation relates to the past. So explaining to them that the questions relating to trauma will help to contextualise their substance use which will also help to gain a better understanding of the relationship between the two and what kind of treatment might be most helpful at this time. You want to also flag with people that talking about traumatic events can be distressing. And that might include folks who, and I'm sure we've all worked with people that really, really want to talk to you about everything that's happened. Um, they really want to give you all the details. And in those situations, it can be really important to help them to kind of not underestimate the level of, level of emotion that might come up for them. But as I was saying, I want you to take heart in the knowledge that while people may become upset when we're talking about what's happened, that if we do this in a really sensitive and considered way, the studies have shown that talking about trauma doesn't overwhelm or re-traumatise the majority of people. Often people describe disclosing and starting to talk about it as a positive experience. They're living it. Um, and I guess the only caveat to that is also being clear when we're doing expectations that we want to be clear with the person about confidentiality and its limitations. So I've just popped in a little screenshot here of um, one way that we kind of think about thinking about trauma at that more stage one level is to really just, you know, one way to frame it is to think about grabbing the headlines, you know, how old was the person, you know, maybe a few words about what's happened. Um, and how they were, you know, did they tell anyone? How did people in their system respond when they did disclose it? Cool, good. Oh, enough for me. Over to Sal. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll offer to uh, provide a, a brief overview of what this means for clinicians and on a personal level being faced with more and more clients, perhaps with increased complex presentations, we may start to feel out of our depth, uh, unable to properly respond to a client's needs. Uh, if any of these things feel familiar to you, uh, they may um, have an overwhelming demand on your service that will start to uh, uh, impede your capacity to support each client and you may start filtering by complexity or um, placing uh, sometimes we need to place unrealistic burdens or demands on the client to remain engaged with wait lists. Uh, the outcome of this can be clients with a certain level of complexity identified as a client that we may need to redirect to another service or just inform them that there is no capacity to support them at this time with their current presentation. And this means more and more clients may be falling through the gaps, not having their needs met by services uh, and uh, experiencing a, an entrenched narrative that they are too difficult, too complex, untreatable, and I don't think that's the, the message that we want to be providing to clients. I don't think anybody wants to be providing that. Uh, if we do want to work towards integrated care, we do need to respond with an integrated approach. As clinicians, we may need to consider ways that we can broaden our approaches and to support uh, this by broadening our networks. We can provide generalist responses to clients without being that specialist in all areas. We can set the basics 
We can identify what's going on for the client. We can validate those concerns. We can build the rapport. Your client is coming to your service or continues to come to your service for a reason. They might present with one or more of the behaviours already identified, despondent, feeling hopeless or helpless or overwhelmed, all red flags of trauma. And the key is they are actually coming back to you. And that means that they have a relationship with you that you can build on and an opportunity to do the work. And that means it might just look a little bit different than you expected, but perhaps it's possible. Thanks, Sal. Oh, great. It's you again. So please don't underestimate the work that you do. Your ability to be kind, non-judgmental, and to listen. Your perspective of that therapeutic relationship here may be vastly different to what your clients are experiencing. And what you may consider as a very run-of-the-mill check-in call might actually mean so much more to your client who may not have any other positive or caring contact in their life. You may be the only person who has asked them how they are or spoken kindly to them. And for our teams, working with complex clients without a network, maybe increasing those uh, levels of compassion fatigue, burnout, low morale, feelings of hopelessness and ineffectiveness of our own. And one thing uh, I would like to acknowledge and one thing that we can do for ourselves is um, understand that what we do is by no means straightforward. And what we can do, reflecting on why we do the work that we do in the first place, it's always helpful to jog us back to remembering why it's worth it. Talking about supporting ourselves and our own well-being is key. With capacity does come limitations. Everything has its limits and it's okay to know where they are and what you need to do to keep yourself and your well-being at the forefront of your work. Role modelling for our colleagues and our clients, the importance of self-care is something that we can do on a daily basis and work that emphasises it's okay to have good self-care in place. It's okay to set good, healthy boundaries. This is what helps us as clinicians to prepare and manage for our sometimes difficult work. So when people ask you, how do you do it? How do you keep working and hearing all that difficult stuff that you hear every day? Well, I guess the big part of that is that we come prepared. If we're not prepared, it can make our work difficult. If I can provide a quick example, the other day perhaps I had maybe 10 minutes to spare. I thought, oh, I'm just going to check something. I do, you know, have, have a hobby. I want to check on a, a sewing technique. I'll see if it's on Instagram. Something very uninvited came into my Instagram feed. I suddenly felt incredibly overwhelmed. It was quite, quite graphic imagery. I felt hopeless and helpless in that moment. I started to feel guilty that I wasn't able to do anything about this information that was being offered to me. And I thought, well, this is a little taste, isn't it, of perhaps how our clients might feel very often. But then if I have to go into supporting someone five minutes later and I'm feeling like that, so something that I thought was going to be five minutes of self-care ended up being something that was quite the opposite. Uh, so I guess that's a little lesson in keeping doing the things that actually help us to feel more capable and confident in our work. Attending to supervision, because this is that privileged space for us. Discuss your clients with your interdisciplinary teams. No one is expected to do this work effectively alone. 
We all need the support and input of our colleagues and our wider teams to offer more effective and holistic responses. Don't fall into the gap or the trap of feeling that you need to do these things by yourself. This is also an opportunity to build your networks, use your existing networks. If you feel you'd like more information about a service or a particular way of supporting a client, float the idea of inviting a relevant practitioner or, or service to provide a PD to your team. There are two statewide services numbers there up on that slide that you might feel like calling. <laughs> You're most welcome to. Uh, if you have a particular skill set and you're happy to let clinicians tap into these, please feel free to email the AOD Pathways number and share your contact details. I'm always keen to hear about what other services are doing and what they can offer. Online meeting platforms have opened up the access and opportunities for information sharing as well. Maybe you could start sharing information online with like-minded services and, and go from there and start building and sharing information about your services and gathering information about others in return. I think also it might be important to uh, recognise that for whatever reason, sometimes we can feel uncomfortable exposing the gaps in our knowledge. So does this hold us back from asking questions from other services or using that consultation support, seeking out secondary consult opportunities um, outside of our usual sphere? Do we need to build a more supported culture around capacity building and seeking advice? I'm always keen to hear also um, how clinicians prefer to access information and, and consults in areas not well known to them. So please uh, share your ideas on this. Uh, you could e email AOD Pathways and I'd really love to hear them. Thank you. Thanks, Sal. I'm a bit mindful of time, but um, I know that Sal would really love to hear from people. She's the queen of networking and um, is very keen to um, really kind of work together. Um, so I'm just going to just touch on some things I guess that I found helpful in the work, hoping that, um, again, this may not be anything new, but just have a, a bit of an overview and, and thinking, I guess, what this might mean for how we work with people. Um, we've also already talked a bit about the window of tolerance, and as I say, that would be a training in and of itself. So I'd really encourage you, if, some of the, if that's of interest to you, to pursue that. And when we um, email the resource list out later, um, we'll have some ideas around where you might be able to do that. So um, I guess, as I say, these are all things that might be familiar with people, may not be as familiar. I guess one of the things I want to highlight in this list is um, how important things like breathing retraining can be and maybe even kind of taking opportunities when we're face to face with people um, and you sense is that their window of tolerance might be kind of getting, you know, they're outside of it opportunities to just do it with folks yeah it helps them to calm down their system really effectively it gives you a chance to see how they're doing it because um, I think sometimes in the past I've probably made the mistake of talking theoretically with people about how to do stuff and then they might come back later and go oh, that that didn't work so actually I think really important if you can to model it with people um, and with things like mindfulness which um, we know can be really helpful in kind of managing um, urges to use and things like that. I just um, encourage you to, you know, when you're talking to people about this, just be really careful that they make a choice around kind of what type of mindfulness activity they might want to engage in. And sometimes it can be strategic to maybe think about initially um, keeping that intervention in an external environment, maybe rather than focusing on something that might be more tapping into how they're feeling, at least until you know the person. I think a great example with mindfulness is often getting people to think about how kids, little kids move in the world. I think they're the best teachers of mindfulness and being in the present moment. Um, so similarly in respect to that kind of connection with body stuff, we kind of all know that things like yoga and, you know, the, the, how, you know, 
I'm sure lots of people have heard about the body keeps the score. We kind of know that there is an interaction between our bodies, our minds and trauma. Um, it's just being mindful of just being really sensitive in that space, depending on the nature of the type of trauma that someone's experienced, um, just to be really um, thinking about how much or how ready someone is to connect with that. Um, Self-care, Sal was talking about that as great. That's that parallel stuff I was talking about earlier. If we can really work on self-care, then we're a great model to the people that we work with. You know, that real routine planning that we're often talking to people about in AOD, making sure that people are getting enough sleep, it's a good diet, exercise, they've got meaning and purpose in their routine. Um, the other thing, as I say, you can maybe go away and um, a bit mindful of the time, go away and, and, and look into some of this in more detail. But the other thing I wanted to highlight in this list is emotional awareness. We we sometimes talk a lot about emotional regulation and, you know, distress. DBT's got some great techniques in that space. But um, this is another one where maybe don't take for granted that people know what they're feeling. Um, sometimes our work is helping people to identify, you know, it might be even in their bodies when they notice a certain shift or a certain part of their body getting them to focus and think about what that might be telling them. Because often if we think about those early experiences, people have not been in environments where they've learned that. Or maybe they've learned that positive experiences shouldn't be, you know, that's a bad thing. Um, so I guess it's very much look to the people that we're working with to get a sense from them what have their experiences of emotions been in their in their lifetime? Um, what do they know of, you know, how do they recognise it? And you can use things like feelings wheels and there's a whole lot of different techniques of doing that. Um, connection. Um, and here I guess I was thinking of not only safe connection to your body and, um, as I've said, you're good, we've got to be careful in that space, I think, a little bit, but also connection to others and um, to community. Um, and that can be really scary for the people that we work with. So really starting to think about how we can help people to make the, those shifts. Um, I put self-compassion in here just because, and again, I think it can be really hard initially for people to kind of engage in this because they just don't have any of it. And it can be a really, um, you know, it's not something that they can readily engage with. So again, I think all of this requires just thinking about the individual that you've got in front of you, where they're at, what you think is going to be best you know, the best course of action, just taking it one step at a time. But ultimately, if we can encourage self-compassion, it can be such a great antidote to the high levels of shame that people that we're working with have often experienced. Um, other things, you know, when we think about kind of self-soothing, think about, um, you know, using sensory objects, there's lots and lots of ways of getting creative with this. I will stop talking because I'll keep going on about otherwise. Um, this I just wanted to uh, think a little bit about. So again, still thinking, seeing it through that lens of window of tolerance, that when people are outside of their window of tolerance, their capacity to learn and take information on can be compromised. So I think it can be really important to think about um, checking in with people. Sometimes you can't always tell when somebody's stepped out of that window of tolerance. So it might be, you know, if you instruct, you're giving somebody advice around how to access detox or how to go about doing something, just to kind of try and get a sense of what they've understood from what you've said and maybe think about using reminders, you know, whether that's in the phone or it's written or things just to support that cognitive burden that they might be feeling. And also when we've talked to people, I'll often be kind of saying, look, I don't know if I explained that very well. What's your sense of what I just said? So that you can get a sense of how much information they've taken in. And with that in mind, um, I think this can be a really um, neat way of thinking about when people are not in the green zone, strategies that can help depending on, you know, are they just like substance use, the overlay that we were talking about earlier, thinking about things that are going to help people to get out of the blue zone, so, you know, that more active stuff and um, people out of the red zone, so learning to kind of ground themselves, take a breath, kind of drink water, that kind of thing. Um, I'm pretty sure we have run out of time, but the next one, and as I say, we'll put it on the resource list, but um, I'm seeing schools these days that are doing a lot of kind of um, providing information on this, just a really helpful way of that psychoeducation I was talking about earlier, helping people understand that, you know, when our um, prefrontal cortex goes offline, no one can kind of think clearly. That's not some kind of personal deficit, um, but that's, again, um, I'm going to keep talking, so I need to stop, don't I, Sal? So here we go. I'll mute myself.
thank you both so much. Um, and sorry, I know um, it's such a complex um, topic. And like you said, you could you could speak for weeks and weeks. Um, I think we might do one question and one question only. Um, we're lucky though that Sally has opened up the communication lines for people to email her. Um, Sally, did you are you able to um, provide your email address in the in the chat? Yeah, I can, and I think I've put on one of the slides has got the AID Pathways email in there as well. Oh, fantastic! Okay, so the recording will be made available to everybody. Um, on our website and the slides will be emailed later uh, this week. Um, our one question and just a quick answer if possible. Um, this person has written much of my understanding of how to work with complex PTSD from clinical practice and study and readings is that the relationship is the intervention in a lot of contexts. Can you share about how this compare with more structured interventions like COPE in the best possible way. Wow, that's um, <laughs> that is a big question, and I think that is sometimes one of the challenges for us in a kind of a shorter term intervention like cope that is quite structured. But um, you know, I, I think um, you know, see, relationships are where I think a lot of the healing work, the, the healing happens, and in longer term relationships, there might be more capacity to kind of know someone and travel through a number of experiences with them but I would say even with something like cope um, it, it can't work without the relationship and without an opportunity to um, go through some difficult experiences together it probably has a slightly different quality and intention to it than some of the longer um, types of therapy that is out there but certainly the feedback we get from people is um, very much around appreciating the relationship and how that's maybe helped them to feel contained. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to thank you both for being so generous with your time and for giving um, our attendees the opportunity to make direct contact with you and for sharing your presentation, which we will forward via email. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thanks Sally and Anna. Thank you. Thanks for hanging in with us, guys.